Would you please stand as I read from God's word? Starting in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. You have found favor with God, Mary. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am your Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. You be seated. Ah, welcome to Nazareth. I always can tell when it's Christmas season all the people who come to my village. Many people like you. And they all come and they all ask the same question. Where did Mary live? Did she live in that house over there? And the well, is that where she drew her water from? And where did her son the Son of God, where did he play? Now, I have to tell you something. If you had come in those days and you had asked the villagers, where did Mary live? They would have looked at you and they would have said, what is a Mary? Is it a thing? Is there a poison? Yeah, I know in your English Bibles it says Mary. But that's because it's interpreted from the Greek. Mary was a Hebrew. And the Hebrew name is Miriam. Miriam. They say it with me. I teach you Hebrew. Miriam. That's not good enough. Let's try again. See if you can roll your R's a little bit. Miriam. Ah, you are most Hebrew now. So, if you had come and you had asked the residents of Nazareth, where is Miriam? They would have looked at you and said, which one? Well, lots of Miriams in Nazareth in all the villages of Israel. And because Miriam is such an important name to my people. You know the story of the Miriams, don't you? No, you don't. Well, 
If you have a little time, I'd tell you the stories. Why don't you have a seat? Well, you already are seated. Well, why don't you stay in your seat? <sighs> long, long, long time ago, in the Tanakh, or what you call the Old Testament, we have the story of my people who were enslaved in Egypt. Now, at first, it was not so bad. You know, Joseph, he came and, and Joseph rescued the Egyptians. He rescued the whole world, if you think about it. And the Pharaoh at that time was so grateful, he said, bring your family. So Joseph's family came and they settled in this place called Goshen. And for a long time, everything was good. And my people, they multiplied like rabbits. So many Hebrews that there was a Pharaoh who forgot about Joseph. And he looked at all the Hebrews and he said to his officials, we can't have this. If we are ever attacked by outside enemies, there are so many Hebrews that they join our enemies, we will be defeated. We must limit the population. And the way we will do this is we will enslave them and we will drive them so hard with slavery, they won't have time to produce. And that's what he did. And the slave masters were cruel. But still, my people multiplied. So he went to the midwives and he said, I need your help. When a Hebrew woman gives birth, I want you to kill the baby during the delivery. But the midwives, they feared God. And they would not do it. And he said, why aren't you doing your job? They said, because the Hebrew women, they're so vigorous. They, they give birth before we have a chance to do anything. And God blessed the midwives. So Pharaoh thought about it and he said, I will make a decree. He said, from now on, if you find any Egyptian, if you find a Hebrew who has an infant son, take all the infant sons and throw them into the Nile River. Let them feed the crocodiles and the my people. They cried out to God, oh God, deliver us. Look at the evil. Please deliver us. And God heard their cry. Now God has unusual ways of doing things. Have you ever noticed? Not like we might do them. And so God sent a deliverer, but not from the outside, one from the inside. One from a poor slave family. A deliverer who Pharaoh himself would educate. <laughs> would turn around and lead the people out. You know how it happened. A woman, her name was Jochebed. Jochebed had a baby. Now, in what we call the Tanakh, your Old Testament, in the second book you call Exodus, in the second chapter, in the second verse, he says that Jochebed, when she saw the baby that had been born to her, she realized this was a special child. So when the baby was born, she quickly thought to herself, I have to hide my baby from the Egyptians. So she wove a basket. And then she took some pitch and tar and covered the outside of the basket to make it waterproof. But where to put the baby? She decided the best place to put the babies where nobody will look, in the Nile River, in the midst of the bulrushes, the reeds. <laughs> nobody will look there. That's where they throw the dead baby. And then she went to her young daughter. What was her daughter's name? Do you remember? You are not good students. 
Miriam, say it with me, Miriam, the first Miriam. And she said to her daughter, Miriam, I want you to watch the baby. For three months, every day, Miriam would watch the basket in the bulrushes, protecting her baby brother with eyes like a hawk. At night, they take him home under the cover of darkness. Nobody noticed. Well, one day, as God would have it, the princess, the daughter of Pharaoh, came down to bathe in the Nile, something I don't recommend to you. And her eyes caught the basket. She saw the basket. And she said to her handmaid, go, get the basket. Miriam's eyes got so big, her heart began to race. Oh, no. She opened the basket. She'll see the Hebrew baby. She'll throw him in the water. My, my little brother will die. When she opened up the basket, he began to cry. Miriam saw in the face of the princess compassion and sadness. Right away, God inspired Miriam, and out of her young mouth, her young heart, her young mind came the wisdom of God. She went to the princess. She said, oh, I can go and find a Hebrew woman who, who has milk, and, and she could feed your baby, and, and after he's weaned, they bring him back to you. What do you think? And God used her words to impress the mind of the princess and, and to touch her tongue. And she said, yes, that is a good idea. You go. You go find that woman. <laughs> Miriam ran home as fast as she could. Jochebed looked at her. What is going on? She says, Mother, I have good news and bad news. The bad news is the daughter of Pharaoh found the baby. Jochebed nearly fainted. Miriam said, the good news is this. God in his wisdom, God in his wisdom has sent the daughter of Pharaoh to protect our baby. Come, mother, no time to faint. So she brought the mother to the princess. And the princess, she handed over to the mother her own baby and said, take him and feed him. And when he is weaned, bring him back. And that's what she did. And she brought him back. And you know what the princess named the baby? What did she name him? No, she named him Musa. You call Moses. See, I teach you much today. Miriam, not Mary. Musa, not Moses. Now, many times when you think of the story of Musa, you think to yourself, he's such a hero. And he is a big hero. I, I admit it. But in this part of the story, who is the real hero? Miriam. Miriam, the little slave girl. Think about this. It is Miriam who delivers the human deliverer. It is Miriam who saves the human savior, who rescues the human rescuer, Moses. Now keep this in your thinking. Miriam, Musa, or Moses, they are pictures of what God is going to do in the future. A thousand years later, there is a young girl named Miriam, in this place called Nazareth, what good thing ever came out of Nazareth? Nothing. Nazareth on the backside of nowhere. Now look at my villages, nothing. But God, God likes to use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God chose Miriam of Nazareth. 
Miriam and her people were living under the feast of Rome. It was a hard life. People were crying out for Messiah that the prophets had promised. Oh, send Messiah, God. Now, before I go any further in the story, I have to correct some wrong thinking in some of your minds. I do this every Christmas. I have to because so many of you come with the wrong thoughts in your mind about Miriam. Oh, you call Mary. Everybody has in their mind that she was some kind of holy child. Like every time you see her, she has a halo over her head or a bunch of angels on the wing singing songs. I don't want to, as you say, burst your bubble, but Mary was a sinner just like all the rest of us. God did not choose her because she was so holy, so righteous. Oh, she was a good girl. But don't forget the scriptures say that all of us, our, our hearts, Jeremiah, our prophet said, our hearts are so wicked, we don't know how wicked they are. Rabbi Paul says that uh, in us lurks evil desires. He meant all of us, including her. But God sent his angel Gabriel to her. And Gabriel looked at her. Do you remember the passage? You know the story. Greetings, highly favored one. <laughs> I think Miriam must have once. Uh, who are you talking about? She did not see herself as highly favored. She's just an ordinary girl, living a plain, ordinary life, engaged to be married to a man. See, in my day, in my country, my people, they get their daughters engaged at 14, 15. They get married a year later. A year later, they have children. They raise the children. The children get big. They leave the home. They get older. Then they die, and the next Miriam takes over. So when God says to his angel, greetings, highly favored one, <laughs> what does this mean? What made her so highly favored? I tell you, the fact that God chose her. That's why the angel says, greetings, highly favored. She's highly favored because God chose her. Do you know the same thing is true about you? What makes you so special to God? You're American. You're black, you're white, you're brown. You're tall, you're short. You're rich, you're poor. You're successful, you're not successful. You're a victim, you're a victor. None of that matters to God. God does not choose us based on what we have to offer him. God just chooses us. He loves us for who we are. Isn't that good? If the world would only act the same way, we wouldn't have all the problems. If the world would behave the same way as God, we would have peace and contentment. Every Christmas, People come to Nazareth looking for peace and contentment. They think they'll find it in some old house, some, some museum from Mary's life or where the baby played. That's not where peace and contentment come from. It does not come from politics. It, it does not come from looks or from wealth. It can only be found in God himself. How does that work? Follow the story. The angel says to, to Miriam, Mary as you call her, God is going to cause his son to be conceived in your womb. He, he will be great and called the son of the most high. He will inherit his father's throne, David's throne. And he will rule Israel forever. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. And then he looked at Miriam and he said, the Holy Spirit is going to come down upon you. God's hand will overshadow you. And the child within you is holy. Do you know what Miriam said to the angel? 
Miriam said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be done unto me as you have said. Another way to translate this, I am all for God. May all he said that he will do in my life come true. And the angel left. Have you ever thought to yourself, how could she do that? Smart girl, she knows. She has to go tell her fiancé, Joseph. She has to tell her parents, I am pregnant and God is the father. How would you feel if your daughter came home and told you that? Would you believe it? It was very real for her. And all the gossip and all the things she would have to deal with. How, how is she? How is Miriam able to do this? Two words. First word, trust. Say with me, trust. No, you have to roll your arms. Trust. That's better. Second word, surrender. Say with me, surrender. Now you say, first word. Second word. Can you do that? Can you trust God? Can you surrender to God? Why would you trust surrender? I answer that question for you. It's a secret. You want to know the secret? I tell you anyway. The secret is in the name Miriam. Say the name. If we go back to the Tanakh, Miriam of Egypt. In the Egyptian language where Miriam, the name come from, remember she lived in Egypt. There is a word in Egyptian that we think Miriam came from and the word, it means love. Say love, love. No, you said love, 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 love. Do you realize that in the Hebrew, the name Miriam, it means bitterness and rebellion. Say it with me, bitterness and rebellion. Again, love, bitterness, rebellion. Now think about this. God's love in the Tanakh, God's love was born in bitterness. The bitterness of slavery to the Egyptians. In the New Testament, as you call it, God's love is born in bitterness. But listen, bitterness because of the enslavement of human beings like you and me to sin and to Satan. Pharaoh Egypt was a picture of Satan and sin. In the Old Testament, God's love is born to rebellion. The rebellion of God's people against God himself. Do you know the story of Miriam in the book you call Numbers, chapter 12? You know what happens. After Musa had delivered the people out of Egypt, Pride came into Miriam's heart. And she said to Musa, who do you think you are thinking that God only speaks to you, that God only speaks through you? God also speaks to me and Aaron, and God speaks through me and Aaron too. And God said, time out. He called Musa, Aaron, Miriam to stand in front of the tabernacle. He called out Miriam, and Aaron, and he said, who are you to say such things against my servant Musa? And immediately judgment came on Miriam, and she turned white with leprosy. She was put out of the camp. Aaron came to Moses and said to Moses, oh Moses, intercede for your sister, for God have mercy. Moses went before God and he said, God have mercy. Have mercy on her. Deliver her. And God said, after the right time, she may come back into the camp totally and completely healed. This is a picture 
of something that happens to you and me. Because in the New Testament, God's love is born in the midst of our enslavement to sin, our bitterness, but also in the midst of our rebellion against God. All of us are rebels. You know it, so do I. But instead of God judging us for our rebellion, God takes our judgment and puts it on his son, Yeshua. You know Yeshua means God saves. And because God takes our judgment out on his son, God can forgive us. All we have to do is trust and surrender. In that way, all of us, all of us are like Miriam. God placed his son in the womb of Miriam when she trusted and surrendered. My friend, this Christmas, God wants to place his son in the womb of your soul. if you will trust and surrender. That is how you come to know peace and contentment. I ask you, bow your head, please. I want you to think about what we have said. I want you to reflect on your own life, your own soul. Do you know the peace and contentment of God.